I am going to be speaking specifically about one agent that we're excited about and are moving forward clinically, but just wanted to make a couple of overview comments, and that is that Merck is a diversified company, company and works in um, many therapeutic areas, HIV being one of them. Merck has worked in HIV really for the past 30 years and has developed many agents, uh, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but Afavirenz, Indinavir, um, the uh, first in-class integrase inhibitor, Tegravir and just last year, Duravirine, which is available as a fixed dose combination as well as a single agent. Um, it has, uh, we have ongoing uh, programs um, in terms of small molecules and, and continue to look at agents, HIV agents, across the uh, classes that we are most uh, familiar with as well as novel agents. And we do have a very active cure um, group in our early discovery uh, group, but kind of um, I didn't bring any of those slides because it's really outside of the scope of uh, this particular uh, talk. So with that just very brief introduction, I'm going to go ahead and talk about MK8591. Um, uh, and what I'd really like to do is talk to you about the agent, tell you why we're excited about it, give you some of the backup data, and kind of tell you where things stand in terms of its development at, um, at this time and going forward over the next uh, year or so. So MK591 is a highly potent, long-acting antiretro uh, antiretroviral agent. It is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, so we call it an NRTTI, with a novel mechanism of action. You can see the chemical structure there. Uh, it is a 4-ethinyl 2-fluoro 2-prime deoxyadenosine, or uh, the other name is EFDA. It uh, affects immediate chain termination, termination via blockage of translocation, and that is through the 4-ethinyl group that you can see in the chemical structure. It forms a very strong bond with reverse transcriptase and, and really inhibits translocation. However, if you do get translocation, note that there is a 3 prime hydroxyl group. There is delayed chain termination after incorporation and an altered VN, uh, viral DNA structure which uh, results from the incorporation of this particular um, NRT, NN, NRTTI um, into the uh, growing DNA chain. It does have potent antiviral activity based on preclinical data. In vitro, the IC50 is low as 1.5 uh, nanomolars, which is equivalent to 0 0.01 picomolars uh, momol, uh, per 10 to the 6 cells. And for anybody who can't remember what a picomolar is, because I had to look it up, it's 10 to the minus 15. So, um, and that's of, of the, that is of the MK8591 um, triphosphate. And antiviral activity in macaque models is about 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 picomolar per 10 to the 6 cells. And I'm going to go through some of these studies with you, but it does have a long half-life in preclinical and early clinical studies. In the macaque, its half-life is about 50 hours. And in healthy adults, the half-life, um, and this is the intracellular triphosphate forms, is about 120 hours. It has no or weak inhibition of human DNA polymerases alpha, beta, and gamma, um, which really uh, would lead, we believe, to a lack of mitochondrial um, toxicity. So what I've outlined on this slide are, are kind of the buckets um, of, uh, of what we think of the attributes of MK8591. And really what we are trying to do is, is mine those attributes in terms of thinking about how we might use it in treatment as well as in prevention. So high uh, potency, um, as I've uh, told you on the previous slide, and I will show you some of the preclinical and clinical data, it has about a ten, it's about a tenfold more active than any available available antiretroviral, and we do believe it will have the ability to anchor two drug regimens. It has a strong resistance profile, a high barrier to resistance, and activity against drug-resistant HIV, and I'll share a little bit of that data with you. To date, and uh, yes, this is early days, in terms of safety, uh, it looks it has been safe in the clinical trials that we have used it in so far. It does avoid a toxicity of some of the available NRTIs, but obviously we will have to show that in clinical trials. It has a long half-life, which allows for infrequent oral dosing or perhaps implants. 
And it provide, if it's going to be used in a daily regimen, it provides forgiveness in a once daily regimen. And it does have favorable tissue um, distribution, at least as we have seen in animal models. Um, and so we think that it might have some interesting um, attributes in terms of thinking about tissue or residual HIV replication. So maybe the potential to impact uh, chronic inflammation. Um, and also in terms of thinking about prevention, if it is concentrated in lymphoid tissue, thinking about uh, how active it might be, for instance, in the genital tract, um, in the GI tract, in terms of prevention. This last box is obviously aspirational at this point, but something that we intend to look at in clinical trials. So I've kind of start, I've started a box on the bottom indicating where we might be going with this drug. The one that I'm going to be talking about today is the use in a daily regimen and in combination with Duraverine, which I mentioned to you, which is a next generation um, in an RTI, and as I uh, said, was uh, FDA approved last uh, the end of last summer in the United States and, and now in and many other countries in the world as well. All right, so um, here's just a few slides on data. So um, as you can see in the table here, you have MK891 and a number of other NRTIs. And you can see uh, the activity that's listed here against wild type for uh, across all of those uh, drugs. And then specifically for MK591 activity against M184 I and V, you might ask why, why is that included? And that is because in serial passages that it is the M184 or V or I um, mutation that classically comes up in, um, in relation to MK8591. In the graph here, you can uh, see the percent inhibition and all of the, the MK591 isolates are in green, so you can see they've been shifted uh, to the left. For wild type, it is uh, 0 0.2 um, for IC50 in terms of nanomolar. This is just to display um, that this drug is active against uh, all HIV-1 subtypes. Um, we have several of the NRTIs listed on the slide. I just draw your attention to the first column, which is MK591, and the full change against uh, a number of subtypes here. So it should be active against uh, all subtypes of HIV. Now, this is a study that was presented last year at Glasgow by uh, Jay Grobler. Um, and I'll walk you through this slide for just a moment. If you look at the y-axis, this is the calculated um, intracellular PBMC, um, uh, IC50 uh, in animolar for these various um, isolates. Each dot here represents an isolate, and on the x-axis you can see isolates that are wild type, and then isolates that have a number of NR, uh, recognized NRTI resistance, resistance sorry, mutations, either single or combined. Then the colors represent the drugs uh, that these uh, isolates were subjected to, and MK891 is in kind of what I call the Merck teal um, kind of green. So what you can see here, um, the dotted green line is actually the IC54 tenofovir alafenamide. So what you can see here is across these isolates uh, that the, I, the uh, intracellular IC50 for MK591 is low and um, really uh, uh, controls, or you see uh, suppression of, across all of these uh, isolates. All right, so I did mention to you that MK8591, um, uh, the, the classic resistance mutation is M184V. So the question is, what, uh, how would that affect the activity? So this is a macaque model. This is a macaque that, has, uh, that is infected with a highly pathogenic um, uh, uh, shiv, and has, the macaque has been treated with 3TC until you see the M184V mutation emerge. At that point, represented again in this T, um, are, the macaque was treated with two single doses of MK8591, and you can see that subsequently there is a four-fold drop in viral load that is sustained through um, the second uh, dose, then uh, viral load does reemerge, and it is the M184V uh, as the drug level falls. So we do believe that at levels that we can achieve um, in the plasma, and certainly intracellularly, that we should be able to deal with M, um, the M184V or I mutation. 
All right, this is uh, in terms of the tissue distribution, um, kind of enrichment in uh, 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 lymphoid tissue here. This is obviously a rat model. Uh, and you, this, uh, the rat has been treated with MK591, then sacrificed. Uh, in the picture here, there's radio labeled MK591, uh, and where you actually see the holes, if you will, for lymphoid tissue, um, that does demonstrate uh, an increased uh, concentration of MK591. That is also reflected here in the table where you see the concentrations one half hour after administration and then 24 hours after administration in a number of lymph nodes. And you can see that the drug is actually concentrated in these lymph nodes. All right, now in terms of talking about prevention, this is, uh, this is a compilation of two studies that have pre presented over the past year or so by Marty Markowitz. This is a macaque model of infection in which macaques were uh, challenged um, on a weekly basis with uh, rect or rectal uh, challenges of a highly pathogenic uh, shiv isolate. They were then treated with either um, serial um, placebo uh, or MK8591 at a number of doses. And what you see here depict depicted in the graph is that for um, macaques that received MK8591, that it was completely protective um, at doses above 0 0.43 milligrams per kilogram. Um, and highly protective down to 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram, which uh, 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 translates out to about 24 femtomoles per 10 to the 6 uh, PBMCs. There were two animals um, out of all of the animals that were treated that did become infected, but they did not become infected until after multiple challenges as opposed to the placebo treated animals which became infected uh, within uh, five uh, rectal challenges and the viremia in those animals were blunted. So it does appear that this drug might have um, a place in prevention and certainly something that we are continuing to explore. All right, so now moving to the clinical arena, this is the phase one uh, study in HIV-infected patients. You can see that there are a number, if you look at the table here, you see doses of 0 0.5 to 30 milligrams were uh, administered. This is one dose, and then the patients were followed for either up to seven or 10 days. You can see at all doses that you did have um, an antiviral effect. And what's listed in the bottom panel here is uh, looking at the, um, uh, a comparison of viral load change from baseline um, compared to the uh, concentration of MK8591 and what is really indicated here is that uh, the robust, robust viral load decline that we saw was associated with the triphosphate concentrations as low as 0 0.05 picomolars per 10 to the 6 cells. Um, uh, and I won't go through all of, uh, all of the other bu bullets here. I've already indicated them. Okay, so that was the one dose. We have done doses for daily, or we've done um, studies with daily dosing now. This is one of the studies, again, was presented uh, by one of my colleagues, Randy Matthews. Uh, and there's a number of uh, things that I just wanted to point out. In terms of the safety in the trial, you can see that listed in the first bullet. There were 17 participants overall with AEs, four of which were drug-related. The AEs had no relationship to dose level or treatment duration, they were all mild or moderate, all resolved, no patient came off study because of a drug-related AE. There was one SAE, patients um, in this particular study, uh, some of them agreed to undergoing, undergo biopsies. I don't have the results of that particular part of it, but there was one SAE of, um, associated with bleeding. Uh, but there was really no, no other SAEs within the study. Uh, you can see that the PK of MK591 was generally dose proportional, that daily dosing results in about a two time, two, uh, time accumulation of the parent with a steady state between days 14 and 21. Um, this, uh, these are the plasma concentrations at two different logarithmic scales here. The point being that even down to the lowest dose of 0 0.25 milligrams, we're able to achieve achieve therapeutic levels in the plasma literally uh, within the first 24 hours. And this is the same study now looking at intracellular concentrations of MK591. And similarly, across all three uh, doses, we're able to achieve intracellular concentrations um, 
therapeutic intracellular concentrations within 24 hours. Okay, so my last couple of slides are just now talking about where we're going with this. And we are, we are our first clinical program is to look at the use of MK891 as a daily antiretroviral. Um, I'm not going to talk through all of this. We have chosen to combine it, probably, I'm sure most of you are not surprised, with another Merck agent, Duravarine. And the second part of this slide really talks about the attributes of Duravarine, and I won't spend more time on that. I, you've certainly know about this drug. This was an in vitro study done really to ask the question, are we, are we going in the right place in terms of uh, thinking about uh, combining these two agents? So again, this is this was an in vitro determination um, using two drug combinations, some of which we would never use clinically. But um, So you see Duravarine and MK591, Duravarine and 3TC, Dolutegravir and 3TC, and Bictegravir and 3TC. Again, these were all done by Merck. Um, uh, and what uh, is depicted here um, is uh, what happens when you go from um, an EC concentration of 0 0.5 up to eight times um, the EC50. And I'll uh, limit my remarks to the double uh, combination of Duravarine and MK591. And it, you can see it four times and eight times the EC50, EC50 which are easily achievable concentrations in humans that the virus is completely suppressed, that there is no breakthrough and no um, mutations. So uh, that helped us to think about, uh, along with uh, much modeling, that this was a regimen that uh, perhaps would be uh, good clinically. Okay, so this is the ongoing phase two study. Um, this, uh, as you can see, there are, um, these are treatment naive patients. You can see the inclusion criteria. Patients were randomized to one of four uh, treatment arms. The control arm throughout is the uh, co-formulation of Duravarine, 3TC, and um, uh, tenofovir. Uh, and the three uh, test arms are three different doses of MK591, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and 2.25. For the first 24 weeks, patients also received um, uh, Duravarine uh, and uh, 3TC. At, by, at week 24, if patients have viral loads of less than 50, or at any point before week 48, when patients achieve a viral load of less than 50, which is confirmed, they then have, <coughs> excuse me, the 3TC dropped, and they remain on the three uh, doses of MK591. Uh, plus Duravarine. And then at week 48, uh, a decision is made about which dose to take forward, and then those patients uh, continue on that dose. Uh, this study has been completely enrolled. All patients are past week 24. We will be presenting the week 24 results at an upcoming meeting. Um, so I, I don't have any results for you at the moment, but uh, you should be hearing them in the not too distant future. On the basis of this study and on the basis of the results, um, we will be embarking on a phase three program. Some of you in this in this hall may have heard about the program because you may have been approached about uh, participating in it. Uh, will be a full range of studies. I'm, I know I'll be asked, so the drug is, go one of the studies is going to be in highly treatment experience patients because we do believe, because of the resistance profile here, that it would have some utility in that patient population. So here's my last slide, just going back to kind of where we are and in that bo in the bottom panel here, I'm sure people are going to ask, yes, we are looking um, at uh, the use of this drug in less frequent than daily regimens, and yes, we are looking at this drug in, uh, in terms of prevention. And thank you for your attention.